times, at different times. And I know Stephen from his past career um, uh, very well. I think I speak for both of us quite relaxed about, you know, you can be head of a delegation, but it's all about how you engage the dynamic between each other. And um, at different points in time, there were different members who led on a particular issue or area, uh, which was, I know, close to their heart. And right at the end, there was a rather grand press conference. And I was asked one of those questions, which is always interesting, being posed to a British parliamentarian, that what can we in Bangladesh, and for that matter, within the Commonwealth, learn from Britain? Now, you have to become very clear and sensitive to being asked such a question, because this isn't telling us or telling everyone else how wonderful we are and you need to do this, that, and the other. On the contrary, our journey as a democracy be a challenging one. We are where we are from the strength of the diversity of our communities and people that constitute what is the modern United Kingdom. But there are things in our past that we aren't proud of. There are other things which we are. And I think the legacy or the real strength of what we are as the Commonwealth is reflected in its diversity. That this isn't a sort of look back to past glories or past uh, rules. This is about where we are today and how we come together as a family of 54 nations going forward. But that's not what I said. They said to me, well, you do all these things so wonderfully. What is the one thing we can learn? And I pondered for a moment and I said, you know what? I go back to my childhood and my mother often said, no matter how much you squabble at home, no matter what fights you pick with your siblings, when you go outside those four walls, you act as one. And that's what we do rather well as British parliamentarians, that we have our challenges, as I'm sure you see quite animated, uh, and not in recent months, but certainly prior to the COVID crisis, the exchanges we have, which are robust, which are challenging, which rightly hold, as Stephen also alluded, the government to account. And that's the strength of democracy. But when we travel and when we travel in representing our countries, we do so with a great sense of pride in representing our country wherever we may be in, in the world. And we do so with a sense of unity that we are together representing our country. And I think that's a personal reflection or anecdote, if I may, of how we as parliamentarians, how those who serve as parliamentarians within government, as I do now as a minister, work together. And I think that also reflects the very attributes of the Commonwealth. Now, what I plan to do for the next few minutes was just to tell you a bit more about myself, what makes me tick, what makes me so passionate about the Commonwealth. I've been uh, now a Minister of State at the Foreign Office for three years, and many of you would have heard of the new coming together of both the Department of International Development and the Foreign and Commonwealth Office. But in this new department that will emerge in September, I'm delighted and I was very passionate to ensure the C that is today of the Foreign and Commonwealth Office will be the same C of tomorrow for the Foreign Commonwealth and Development Office because the Commonwealth is quite unique. This incredible coming together of 54 nations of the world. And as we've got today on Scholars, I had a quick glance at the incredible talent that we have and literally both in terms of country represented. But if you say, let's see, we are starting with Antigua and fi finishing with Zambia. We really have got the A to Z of the Commonwealth at this meeting with us today. And it's great delight to join. Now, there's a sort of personal side to this when it comes to the Commonwealth. Um, I'm a product of the Commonwealth. You know, my parents were both from India. I'm a born and bred Brit and passionate about it. My wife, she was born in Pakistan, grew up in Australia. Now, some would suggest that our three children are somewhat confused in terms of their identity. On the contrary, they're very proud of the fact of the different cultures, communities, religions, and countries they represent. So I'm very proud that amongst the other badges I wear and labels I wear, I regard myself as a walking, talking product of the Commonwealth and its vibrancy today. And that I think that personal level of passion, if I can call it that, but the real engagement of learning what one's own personal journeys are and where you are today makes me really hugely privileged and honored to be serving as Minister of State for the Commonwealth. I reflect back to 2018 when we assumed our role as chair in office. Uh, the then Foreign Secretary, now Prime Minister, was uh, someone I got to know very well and we worked very closely with him. And he's a great man who likes the setting the scene at one point, you know, because of the 
challenges perhaps we couldn't quite meet the ambition he set myself. I remember on a lighter note, one of the first things he said to me, he said, Tarek, bring me elephants down the mall. Now that was quite an interesting first ask of the Foreign Secretary to the Minister of State for the Commonwealth. And whilst we didn't quite get the elephants down the mall, what we did get was the incredible spectacle of people of all different backgrounds, countries, communities coming together, the heads of government coming together as one in London. And you know what? London provided the weather to match. I, I had many Caribbean, Asian, and indeed uh, Australian friends saying to me that, look, we brought you the weather. I said, no, mm -hmm. like the Commonwealth, we're proud of our role as Britain. And this is British weather laid on for our Commonwealth friends. But there was a great sense of commitment, but also a great sense of conviction of what we can achieve together. And there were some remarkable decisions taken at London in 2018. And notwithstanding the COVID challenge, I'm very much looking forward to working hand in glove with uh, Rwanda, as we already are. I've been having quite regular calls with the Foreign Minister of Rwanda on seeing how we can continue to work together on ensuring there's a continuity on the decisions that we made, whether it was on issues of cyber security, whether it was investing in girls' education and youth, or whether it was looking at the challenges of climate change, that we come together and see what we can do together collaboratively as the Commonwealth. Now, within my role, I have a uh, incredible scope. Um, quite often I'm asked to speak at various Commonwealth events as I am today, but I'm hugely proud of the engagement we have within the context of the Commonwealth. And uh, in the interest of time, I just share a few areas that we've really been pleased to achieve. Now I'm Minister of the United Nations as well, as was said in my introduction. And one of the things that struck me when you see these different groups operating within the context of multilateral fora within the United Nations, Perhaps what we didn't do as effectively was bring the Commonwealth together. So I pay tribute to our ambassadors, uh, now our ambassador over in Washington, Karen Pierce, who really took up the challenge for me and said, Minister, we will deliver. And there was not a meeting that I had whenever I was in New York for a UN meeting, which didn't have a Commonwealth element to it, whether it was a breakfast with the permanent representatives, whether it was coming together on a common agenda, such as climate change, environment, and oceans cleanup, it really made me realize the real strength of what was an idea turning into a demonstrable quality. So we've now formalized formal briefings for Commonwealth members, such currently South Africa, the UK, we welcomed uh, St. Kitts onto, um, St. Vincent and Grenadines rather, onto the uh, Security Council, and coming together as countries of the Commonwealth and how we can brief together on the priorities and also engage on the Security Council amongst other fora on the important issue. The other area I just wanted to reflect on is I'm also Minister for Human Rights. I often say the greatest test of someone's own principles and beliefs is how you stand up for the rights and beliefs of others. Now, whether we're talking of issues of gender, whether we're talking of issues of LGBT, whether we're talking on issues of religious, faith and of course race which has dominated the agenda um, over recent weeks. I think it's important that what is the Commonwealth? It's about bringing these values together. The strength of the Commonwealth is yes through its democratic principles of good governance. It's about looking at the rule of law. It's about looking at justice and accountability but also importantly it's how we represent the rights of our own citizens but within the context of the Commonwealth family how we stand up for vulnerable communities around the world. Now, I'll be the first to say that the Commonwealth in itself, when we look at the spread of 54 countries, that we're, we're not there. We've got a long way to go. But it's for us such as these, where we bring together the next generation, all of you, the Commonwealth scholars, who are looking currently at the Commonwealth, who are looking at the dynamics within their own countries. And as we heard from Stephen, there's many scholar of the past who's gone on to become leaders of their own countries. And when you look at the scope that 60% of the Commonwealth is under 30, it is important that we focus on that agenda. And it's through events like this, to people like me, who are the current decision makers of today, that we can ensure those significant opportunities which need to exist for the youth around the world, but particularly within the Commonwealth context, are clearly understood 
but also made available to every single citizen who so desires it. And therefore, again, I was delighted in London that during the Commonwealth Heads of Government meeting, for the first time, we had at least one individual, and we asked that of each member state that attended, that they had at least one member of their official delegation, not just in the margins, but an official member of their delegation who was under 30. We had a youth forum where His, His Royal Highness Prince Harry was an incredible uh, magnet and convening power in what he did about bringing youth together. And I think it was a demonstrable show of solidarity across the Commonwealth that no matter what our backgrounds, what our communities, what our faith, what country we represent, that when we come together as a Commonwealth family of nations, what can be achieved. So there's still much to be done, but we need to reflect on what has been achieved thus far. And I look forward to hearing some of your questions, your reflections, your observations. And I say very candidly and openly to, to all of you, that if you have got suggestions which help to improve the workings of the Commonwealth, if you've got ideas which help to improve the workings of your own government and indeed the Commonwealth family, just don't sit back. And I'm sure most of you have already that energy and enthusiasm uh, to come forward. Don't shy away from presenting your ideas. And I end, if I may, where I started, you know, on sort of a couple of uh, personal anecdotes, if I may. Um, there are many passions, and I'm often asked, Tarek, you know, what really make you tick? And I've alluded to, and I hope in my words, about what I feel about the Commonwealth. But my family's important. I'm sitting here at home at the moment. I have the great challenge of going into Parliament on occasions as we operate hybrid, going into the Foreign Office, into DFID. Uh, but also, I think the recent challenges of uh, COVID-19 have demonstrably, certainly in my experience, shown to me the importance of relationships. And people ask about what have you learned during the COVID-19 crisis? Well, firstly, as a Liverpool fan, I was delighted that after 30 years of hurt and wait, we finally won the Premier League. Now, this means a great deal to me, and not least because I've got an eight-year-old son who doesn't know what Liverpool winning the title means. I grew up, for those who are interested footballers, in the Ray Clements, Kenny Dalglish era. Although anyone who asks me a question about the football result last night with Man City, where we rather trounced 5-0, would be saying we were just mainly being courteous, as British people often are to the former champions of the Premier League, and we'll leave it there. But on a more serious note, I think the COVID challenge has shown to all of us, and to us in government, it's an absolutely clear challenge, that the way to resolve the issues, the challenges of the world, we're at our best when we work together. And ultimately, the interdependency of humanity is there to be seen. How we're meeting the life channel uh, challenge of how we meet the health needs across the world of the most vulnerable. And importantly, I'm proud of the fact that we hosted an incredibly successful summit on vaccines, which raised over $8.8 .8 billion for the most vulnerable, for the children of this world. And that again demonstrated to me that notwithstanding our domestic challenges, the issues around economies and ensuring people stay safe, but also stay supported in their jobs and professions, often because they can't fulfill those obligations, Notwithstanding all of that, when the world came together, we were able to raise money for the most vulnerable. And that shows an inherent strength of what is our common humanity. So thank you once more for inviting me to be part of this meeting today. I'm really grateful. I look forward to working with all of you. I look forward to working with Stephen and his team. And I think this is the first time I, um, I'm saying in person, congratulations to him on his new role. But I really look forward to working with you as we continue as chair in office of the Commonwealth and build towards that common future in Kigali in 2021. Thank you so much, Alistair. Minister, thank you very, very much indeed. I was with you all the way until you mentioned Liverpool, but I'm an Arsenal fan, so I wasn't so sure about that bit. But the rest of it, I mean, it was so forward-looking, personal, committed, uh, and really encouraging for all of us who are committed to Commonwealth interests. So thank you very, very much. Now, there are questions. We won't be able to take all those that uh, want to ask them, but um, I'm going to start, if I may, by calling on uh, Ed Ebola, 
uh, Adedoyin, excuse me if I've not pronounced your name correctly, although I have visited Nigeria on a number of occasions, but perhaps you would like to put your question, Adebola, to the minister. Thank you very much. I'm Adebola, a master's student at the University of Bath. I'm currently studying um, international development. Thank you very much, sir, uh, for that speech and for your works at the Commonwealth. Uh, my question is, will the merger between the DFID and the Foreign Commonwealth Office um, implicate or have effects on education interventions in African countries or Asian countries? Or what are the implications of this merger on education um, interventions in Africa and Asia, especially for displaced persons and refugees. Thank, thank you. you. Minister? Yeah. Well, thank you for that. First and foremost, uh, I feel I'm back in Parliament asking, uh, being asked a question on the merger of the FCO and DFID. Um, I just take you back. First of all, what is the motivation behind this? I remember when Boris Johnson, our Prime Minister, was Foreign Secretary, and in as the Minister also in the House of Lords, once a month we used to have a catch-up. I'd see less of him in the division lobbies. So we used to get together for breakfast. And in that, he's a man who be, believes in great passion about um, education. He's a man who believes in great passion about resolving some of the core challenges of the world, including on educating the most vulnerable. And that's why this passion he has for girls' education translated into not just talking about it, but supporting it financially um, as well. Within the context, why I say that is that part of the challenge that was often faced um, within the Foreign Office, and I remember because I was a Foreign Office Minister, that's how I started before becoming a DFID Minister as well. There were occasions, not everywhere, that there were parts of the world that the strength of our diplomacy wasn't aligned with the work we were doing in the development sphere. And it's important when you're representing your country's interests abroad that you do so in a very collective form. We've been talking about how countries act together and come together. And certainly for me, in my own experience over the last three odd years on the international stage, the strength of how we work as a United Kingdom on a bilateral basis, how we work as a United Kingdom in a multilateral fora, as such as the Commonwealth, the United Nations, and how we work through regional alliances. We need to bring together, whether we're talking diplomacy, development, trade or defense, it's important how we bring together our equities to ensure that we're really strengthening our bilateral ties. So rather than it being seen as a dilution, I think uh, the fact that the new department will have the word development, I alluded earlier to being proud of the C, I'm also proud of the D, um, because I think that will reflect that the development uh, aspects of the merger will be very much reflected in the new department. I'm also Minister for HR across both departments, and I can assure you with the great number of staff meetings we've been holding by both the DFID Secretary most recently with the Foreign Secretary. We have again, to our own people, given reassurance about the importance of really embracing the development insights and experience in the new department as we move forward. And that's an ambition which has been stated from the top by the Prime Minister. The other assurance I can give you is we're absolutely committed to the 0.7%. There was a cross-party agreement when this was enshrined in law and I'm very proud of that achievement. I was part of the coalition government that saw that legislation come to light. But it'd be fair to say there are always exceptions, but the general thrust of parliamentarians, irrespective of what party you represented, was in favour of ensuring that our obligations to the people, the most vulnerable, those who need immediate humanitarian assistance, those who need to be alleviated from poverty. We earlier, I know, reference was made to various SDGs as well that we show our commitment by actually enshrining in law. So irrespective of change of governments, it would require a major change to allow for this to be sort of undone. And I think we stand very firm, as the Prime Minister said, on the commitment to the 0.7%. Of course, with the challenges we've had domestically, the actual uh, commitment is based on GNI. Our own GNI has been impacted like anywhere else in the world on because of the COVID crisis. But we've been over the last few weeks, even in advance of the merger being announced, going through to ensure 
that our priorities are reflected in keeping programs running on the ground, uh, reflecting our commitment on the key priorities such as humanitarian relief, alleviating priority. I've already alluded already to the important work being done in the vaccine field. That money was not just for fighting COVID-19 because we're still working on that vaccine, is ensuring that we don't lose sight of the important strides we've made on issues of eradicating malaria, which the Commonwealth has done a fantastic job on, and also things such as polio and cholera, which remain challenges which are live within the world and live within the context of the Commonwealth. So, um, for you, both through our people and our programmes, we remain very committed. Minister, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm very keen that we have one more question before you vanish. Um, we've already uh, uh, had a very good presentation from you, but there's a very personal question from Abbas Gaba. Uh, would he please put the question, put it briefly, and Minister, I'm sorry to ask you to answer it fairly curtly as well, but uh, Abbas, are you there, Abbas Gaba? Yeah, yeah. hi, thank you so much. Great. I'm from Delhi and I'm studying Master of Public Policy at Oxford. So you've had your career in politics and outside, so my question is around politics. So as Similar to the UK, India has two main political parties, and I feel more inclined towards one party. But um, I hope to enter active politics. But there are scenario when I scenarios when I disagree with the party stand. So would you uh, speak your mind and say what the right thing to do is, or uh, I mean, how do you see this dichotomy? Do you uh, defend your party or stick to your values in that case? Thank you so much. Right. Uh, very good very... question that should be put to all politicians, I think. <laughs> <laughs> No, and it's a perfectly pertinent question to her. I think when we join the party, ideologically, you need to understand why you join. I joined the Conservative Party in 1994. Now, this was a time when anyone who remembers, and I'm sure Stephen remembers this very well, uh, as someone who won a resounding victory in 97, half my friends thought I had lost the plot, you know, and being of a particular background, ethnicity, there weren't many people drawn from the minority communities of UK to the Conservative Party. But my argument was very based on, I looked at the ideolo ideology of the party, the philosophy behind the party, and I said, could I be able to defend the fundamentals of what my party stands for in terms of meritocracy, rule of law, family, uh, so on and so forth. And that's the one thing that, as to why I became a Conservative, that I could knock on someone's door on a closed cold November night and actually articulate my party's policies, not through just populism, but because it was the right thing to do based on principle. On the issue of where there are differences, have I had them? Absolutely. Um, uh, there are occasions which arise. And I remember having a very pertinent conversation with um, uh, one of my colleagues over an issue which arose on the international stage um, without giving and divulging too much secrets on this. Um, we both agreed that there was the same policy and you have as a politician the opportunity to resign if you feel so strongly that you can step down. I also take the view that if you believe passionately in both an issue and you believe in the principles of your party until such time that you feel it's no longer going to have that impact. If you really believe in something, you have to change from within and you make your arguments and you present your arguments on that progressive pro, uh, program from within the party. And that's certainly what I've sought to do. There's been a number of issues. Um, I, my style is not to always go out and crow about them and say, look what I've achieved. Look, I believe because it's the right thing to do that I will continue to do that. And at times you cajole, at times you convince, and at other times you really fight on the point of principle of what matters to you within the context of your party. But I end, if I may, um, just by saying that I think the strength of democracy and the strength of good governance within party allows you to. Whether it's the Conservative Party, the Labour Party, I, I would argue you said there were two main parties, yes, um, but um, being a member of the House of Lords, we have 100 plus members of the Liberal Democrats as well. So um, I think it's healthy when you have pluralism in party politics because it adds to the diversity of discussion and debate. And I think there are also important issues where parties agree. Quite often, if I can just share with you a final sense of a minister. Uh, can, can you please make it a minor, uh, final one because we've got to move on. But, and, you, um, and uh, which is this, that you may say things within the chamber, but one of the things I learned is about relationships. 
uh, quite often when it comes to particularly sensitive issues. Um, uh, the leading member, my shadow minister uh, on the Labour side, I will actually talk to them outside the chamber. I will take them into confidence to give them an insight, to help them understand and contextualise the challenge we're facing. And that's been an important learning of public life. But thank you for your time. My apologies on uh, elongating my answers, but I hope it's... Answers have been superb. Um, if this was a physical gathering, we would now break for, for tea and cakes and you would be um, bearded by lots of Commonwealth scholars who want you to extend your answers, but you've given... Oh, very... me a digestive. Oh, you lucky thing. None of us have got a chocolate digestive. That's You are lucky. Anyway, Minister, thanks so much. You really have given us your all and uh, that was so comprehensive, wide ranging and above all, it was forward looking. I, I, I'm really grateful. We're very privileged to have had you with us. I know your time's been quite precious this afternoon, but thank you very, very much indeed. I don't know, can everyone give him a virtual clap because we're lucky to have had the minister. So yeah, there you are. <laughs> Thank you, Lord Ahmed, very much. Bye -bye. And, and we actually move from the House of Lords uh, now to the House of Commons. And of course, we're going to have a uh, current serving MP, Harriet Baldwin, speaking to us. Now, Harriet is a, a, a very distinguished member of Parliament. Uh, she's been in Parliament since 2010 as a member for West Worcestershire. Um, she's held many great positions in work and pensions, trade, the Whips office, which is responsible for government business in defence. And um, I first heard her speak in her role as Minister of State for Africa. So as we have many Africans with us, it's very uh, particular pleasure, I think, that we have a minister who really knows her onions about Africa. Um, Harriet Baldwin, MP, could you please be kind enough to talk to us and then we'll again have one or two questions at the end. Harriet Baldwin, MP. She was there. There we go. I've unmuted. <laughs> well, you've unmuted. I forgot to tell yeah, you. Yeah. That. Hello, yeah. Harriet. I'm Alastair. Thank you very much. Have you been with us throughout or have you just joined I, us? I just uh, heard the end of Tariq uh, Ahmed's speech there and um, I just want to say good afternoon to everybody and thank you very much for inviting me to spend some time with the Commonwealth Parliamentary Asso Scholars this afternoon and, uh, exactly. and how uh, absolutely wonderful it is to join you, albeit virtually. Um, I'm joining you from my home in West Worcestershire, which is in the beautiful Malvern Hills. I hope that uh, during your time in the UK, uh, you do get a chance to visit Worcestershire because uh, it is absolutely glorious and you would uh, be ensured of a, of a warm welcome. And I'm in Worcestershire today because it's a Friday. And although Parliament is sitting, typically um, we won't sit on a Friday and that allows uh, members of Parliament like myself um, to travel back to meet with the people who, who send us to Parliament and to catch up on uh, constituency news. Um, as Alistair was saying, I'm a former minister. I'm now on the back benches. Um, I'm uh, chairing the British group of the uh, Interparliamentary Union. I'm also on the executive of the Commonwealth uh, Parliamentary Association and I chair um, the All Party Group for Global Education, which campaigns for the 12 years of quality education uh, for every child. Um, I'm also chair of the All Party Group for uh, the Sudans, amongst uh, other activities. And, uh, and thanks to Stephen Twink, who I think I saw earlier on the call, I'm also a privilege yeah. to be involved as uh, co-chair of the um, uh, inter uh, uh, of the interparliamentary union for education effectively the the parliamentarians who campaign for education and so it's a great privilege for me to be able to speak to you this afternoon um, because I know that you are all going to be future leaders in your countries and I think that forming these networks and these links um, at an early stage in life. It's something I wish I had known about at your age because I think it just makes our voices so much more powerful when we can work together towards the, the common good and uh, as spelt out in the sustainable uh, development goals. So it's wonderful to join you and as a backbench MP uh, we find that uh, we spend Mondays to Thursdays typically in Parliament or where we're voting on legislation 
Uh, this week we had an eclectic uh, range of uh, votes that we uh, took part in. There was one, um, uh, uh, there were some for the finance bill, which is the Chancellor's budget left over from March, still has to be turned into law. And then we had um, a, a piece of emergency legislation on Monday, uh, which was to extend the powers of pubs and restaurants to open up outside on tables and for people, people to be able to sit outdoors more easily with less regulation in the summer. And of course, that's a response to the fact that tomorrow is a big milestone in terms of our, our route back to a new normal from uh, the, the COVID uh, uh, pandemic. And we're reopening a lot of hotels and uh, pubs and hospitality venues, restaurants tomorrow. And I've been spending the earlier part of today going around uh, to visit a lot of those establishments and to see how they've made amazing adaptations. So I've been into uh, one of my uh, lo famous local restaurants. They've put up very elegant, very sort of architecturally beautiful uh, perspex screens between each table on the, uh, on the, on, on, in, the, in, the uh, in the restaurant. But I digress somewhat. So um, I, uh, uh, as Alistair said in his introduction, I've been a member of parliament now for just over a decade. Uh, I was first elected in 2010. I've had uh, three uh, further re-elections since then. And um, I know that um, you know, every country has commonality, but every country is slightly different. And certainly, you know, I think uh, for me, one of the strengths of our parliamentary system is that link that you have uh, to your local community, the fact that you are able to uh, visit regularly and meet the people who, 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 who elect you, um, and uh, that you have that closeness of communication. And uh, we've all been dealing with very high levels of, of communication recently. Um, and then uh, back in Parliament, of course, we're operating in a different way from normal. We're operating uh, so that we have to stay far apart when we're voting, and that's uh, been quite challenging, but we're getting used to that now. And we have to have um, a Commons chamber, you've probably seen photographs, um, which is uh, really virtually empty. It can only hold 50 people. And uh, that's quite a change from the, the sort of 650 MPs who like to crowd in there for big occasions like Prime Minister's questions and for, uh, for budgets and so on. And it's also been quite challenging in terms of getting through line by line legislation. There's not enough big committee rooms. Um, you can't have any of the meetings you would normally hold in Parliament. You can't meet with visitors or constituents in Parliament. Normally it's open to the public. So it is, uh, feels very different, um, but fortunately we have media like uh, Zoom and uh, all the other technological advances that are helping us uh, remain close to uh, the people that we represent. So that's a little bit about me. Um, I'd be thrilled to take questions from all of you. I heard uh, Tarek's, uh, most of what Tarek was saying, and he was saying how powerfully important this network is and um, how important uh, we as UK parliamentarians find this network to be. And we wish you every success in your studies here and have a wonderful time here, but also great success when you return to your countries with your, with your degrees from the UK. Thank you very much indeed, Harriet. We, um, we invited you, uh, as we do every year, invite a Member of Parliament to speak about what it's like to be a Member of Parliament on a day-to-day -day basis in the Commons and moving about your constituency and so on. And you've done that perfectly. You've summarised it. And of course, shortly, we'll be hearing from Lord Luce, who'll give us the kind of opposite view from the House of Lords, although he is also former Member of Parliament in the Commons. But Harriet, thank you so much for that. And I'm sure there will be questions. Indeed, I've got one from uh, Angela Karanteng from Ghana. Um, Angela, are you on screen? Maybe you could put your question directly to Harriet Baldwin. Thank you. thank you. Hello, how are you? Akwaba. Thank you. So I would like to ask, what are the initiatives and practices in place to encourage more women and people with disabilities to be part of the parliament, both in the UK and in the Commonwealth as a whole. Thank yeah, you. thank you. Thank you so much. And um, uh, lovely to see you. Um, and I know that, uh, you know, one of my motivations uh, for going into politics, because I like to say that for the first 50 years of my life, I was a normal person. I, I wasn't a, 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 a look fairly normal, Harriet. <laughs> 
I, I was uh, I, I was uh, I was not a politico. I wasn't involved in politics. I wasn't a member of a political party. But I began to realize that you know from my perspective in terms of my political views, there didn't seem to be very many women in my party. In fact, I think at the time when um, I first uh, got involved, uh, there were 17 women in the Conservative Party. And uh, so I realized that actually if I wanted to see change in my lifetime, and I have a strong ambition to see 50-50 Parliament in my lifetime, I think we're about 30, 31% at the moment, um, that um, you know, I, I couldn't just sit on the sidelines, I had to be part of, uh, of seeing that change. And uh, I'm very, very pleased that I did get involved in politics. It's incredibly rewarding. It's um, a job that uh, I think um, you know, women are amazing at. I've got some amazing female colleagues. And um, I thoroughly um, uh, involve myself in all of the efforts and the outreach um, within the UK to try and encourage more women to think about politics as a career, but also as a second career, as it was for me. And so um, I think it's, um, uh, it, 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 you know, we're making good progress, um, but we've still got a very long way to come. And I note the fact that it's only, you know, 100 years since we've actually had women in uh, our parliament in the UK. And I note the fact that it's only just been uh, the case that we have um, had in the whole history of the United Kingdom and the length of that, uh, that we've only just gone past the point where there are more women in history who've been members of parliament in the UK than there are men currently sitting in our parliament. Thank you very much. Um, I hope that's all right, Angela. Uh, excellent answer anyway, passionate one. Karimi, who's studying at Sheffield Hallam University. Um, Karimi, are you there? Yeah, hello. Hi. Hi. Yeah. Um, love all right, the thank background, you. Karimi. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for the opportunity. Yeah, and it was a lovely you. background. <laughs> Is that <laughs> in England? <laughs> anyway. Thank you very on. much. Thank you very much for this, um, this um, opportunity even to study here and just be part of this forum. My question is how committed is the UK Parliament in tackling issues of systemic racism in the UK? And then what are the policies and practices in place that can be borrowed to tackle similar issues of tribalism and or nepotism in Commonwealth countries? I'm interested in this because I'm from Kenya and we have real issues of corruption based on, you know, who knows who. And it's a very pertinent question. If I may just uh, inter intervene for a sorry? moment. Uh, headline news today was uh, uh, probably our country's most distinguished historian has had yes. to resign his uh, fellowship in Cambridge because of uh, accusations of systemic racism. So Harriet, what's your response to Karimi's excellent question? Yeah, I think uh, you raise an important point, and as uh, Alistair says, a very, very topical point as well, because I think we would all be very frank and on it, honest with ourselves and say that although you know, in all of our lifetimes, we've made progress um, uh, in the UK and, um, uh, and I hope in other countries there's been progress. There's still a long way to go, just as I articulated when it came to uh, women in politics. We still uh, have room to uh, go in terms of making sure that people from all backgrounds um, and whatever race, uh, they have all the opportunities on a level playing field. And that still is not the case in the 21st century. We've really got to make sure that we keep on um, uh, making sure that our, our society uh, is as, uh, welcoming uh, to everyone as it can be and that everyone from every background has the opportunity to succeed. Thank you very much. Um, we've got a question from South Africa to Chepo. Uh, Manakedi. Mm. Yeah, yes, you on screen. Thank Hi. you. Put your question to the MP. Yes. Uh, thank you. My name is Sapom Nakedi. I'm also at Sheffield, but University of Sheffield, doing my PhD in Evan Studies. My, my question relates to Zimbabwe. What measures is Parliament implementing to ensure that the global community is aware of the human rights violation in Zimbabwe, given the historical ties of Zimbabwe to the Commonwealth? And just mm. also given its importance to the SADC region. 
Thank you. Mm, mm, mm. I thought we would yeah. admit this question because um, Zimbabwe's got a very special relationship to the Commonwealth and uh, and it's a question asked, I think, with a certain amount of personal anguish. So, uh, mm, Harriet. Mm. Well, I would say that it's, um, you know, my sincere wish would be that, uh, that Zimbabwe would uh, be able to uh, fulfill its uh, its its potential and its um, you know opportunity that is there and being offered by the international community. The UK very much at the lead um, uh, in terms of that to follow a path that would enable it to um, find uh, its way back into the family of the Commonwealth. But I would have to say that the evidence, uh, or even despite the you know the, the optimism that came with the uh, the end of the Mugabe era, I think um, it's, it's very hard to remain um, optimistic about the way in which uh, the uh, reports coming out of Zimbabwe continue to concern uh, us, and it doesn't it doesn't uh, encourage us that that path which is so open to the people. Of Zimbabwe um, is is being followed, but um, as you know, the Commonwealth is a very inclusive organisation and one where they would always want to to welcome new members, um, provided they uh, you know uphold all the uh, characteristics that we would expect from Commonwealth members. And uh, to go back to the point that was raised earlier about about corruption and um, you know as citizens of the Commonwealth, how incumbent it is on all of us. Uh, to call out and try and fight against uh, corruption and uh, to try and call, call for uh, transparency and for um, a, a societies that don't rely on who you know but who you are and what you're able to do and what you're able to contribute and I think that we should all of us as Commonwealth citizens commit together that these are the things that we want to fight for within our commonwealth that these are the values that really matter to us within our commonwealth and that we are an association of people who um, stand for something and that these are the things that we want to fight for. Harriet, um, if I may say you represent the best values of the British House of Commons and uh, having you here this afternoon, I have to, unfortunately to draw the question and answer a bit, bit to a close because of the need to press on with time, but um, we're so pleased and I hope there'll be a future occasion when we can ask you to come back and speak at greater length because you, you've given us a wonderful idea, I think, of what it's like to be a working MP, uh, but you've also shown your own personal values and commitments. So uh, I just can't thank you enough. And on behalf of all the Commonwealth Scholars, um, well, have a decent weekend and thank you very much indeed. Um, it's a pleasure and I hope you all have a wonderful time studying in the United Kingdom. We're really, really delighted that you're with us and I hope that soon we'll be able to actually meet in, pe in person. Yeah, well, that's lovely. Thank you very, very much. Bye-bye. Well, goodbye. And so from the House of Commons to the House of Lords, physically it's only a stone's throw, uh, as those of you who are going on the virtual tour of the Palace of Westminster shortly uh, will see for yourselves. But um, the House of Lords, colour is red, the House of Commons colour is green, uh, is represented this afternoon by Right Honourable Lord Luce, Richard Luce. Uh, as I said uh, earlier, he has been a member of the House of Commons as well, a very distinguished government minister who served uh, in a number of roles, particularly in the Foreign and Commonwealth Office, and as um, I think still perhaps the longest serving minister of the arts that we've had in this country. Uh, he's got his academic side, he was Vice Chancellor of the University of Buckingham. Uh, he headed Her Majesty's household, the royal household, as Lord Chamberlain uh, for six years, and he has been governor of Gibraltar, one of the um, few surviving British overseas um, territories. So we are enormously proud of the fact that Lord Luce is with us this afternoon. And Richard, you're going to tell us a bit about um, the day-to-day -day life of being a working peer. So welcome to Lord Luce. Thank you very much. Um, may I first of all say that um, it's intriguing. I'm very incompetent at technology and it took me 20 minutes to get into the proceedings. But here it shows how magical it can be because oh, yeah. the Commonwealth is all about networking. And here we are, from all parts of the Commonwealth, talking to each other in different locations. And that's what can make the Commonwealth 
magical and I think it's wonderful. As for Conwell Scholars, I'm so pleased to be with you. I remember leading a debate some years ago in the Lords when I felt the government wasn't doing enough to support Conwell Scholars and a lot of very competent people supported me, former ambassadors and so on. And as a result, we got uh, more money for Conwell Scholarships. Now, I will just speak very briefly. Uh, I am, in fact, I would perhaps just to say a former chairman of the Conwell Foundation. It's the, the non-governmental side of the Commonwealth. And I did that um, as the only British former chairman uh, in the 90s. And I realize how important this side of the Commonwealth is. Now, on the House of Lords, I've had the privilege of having experience of 21 years in House of Commons and 20 years until this week in the House of Lords because I decided on a voluntary basis to retire last Monday. And I can look at uh, 41 years of experience in both chambers. There is a big difference, and this needs to be emphasized between the Commons and the Lords. The Commons, of course, is elected, and the House of Lords is appointed. And the role of the House of Lords is different from the House of Commons. It is really a revising role, a scrutinizing role. Uh, for example, the most important thing of all, probably, is scrutinizing legislation which comes from the House of Commons, very often not properly scrutinized. And in the Lords, you have a range of expertise where people can scrutinize a bill very, very carefully. And if there are bits that they think need improving, they return that part of the bill to the House of Commons. And the House of Commons then has to decide whether they're prepared to accept it. It does explain sometimes why Prime Ministers every Prime Minister doesn't awfully like the Lords. And that is because uh, the Prime Minister would like all his legislation or her legislation to go through easily. But in fact, any Prime Minister ought to be grateful to the House of Lords because what the Chamber does is to improve legislation. And I emphasize that more than anything else because I think it's probably the most important. But then because it's an appointed Chamber, we've got we're not elected, we've got a range of, enormous range of expertise. Former law lords, top scientists, great medical people, a few poor former politicians like me, and many, many other areas of expertise. And that is why we are like that, because we can scrutinize and give expert judgments on things. And that's why, for example, the work of select committees is very important on any subject you might choose. It may quite soon be on COVID-19 and the lessons to be learned. You will have experts who will examine all that. Uh, of course, you've got freedom to, uh, freedom to speak on uh, any range of issues. I've led debates on the Commonwealth. I've led debates on higher education uh, and on a number of other issues. Um, and this can have an effect, but I can't uh, impress upon you enough the key role uh, of the chamber is to tell the government of the day and the House of Commons sometimes, just think again. Think again on this issue. You've not quite got it right. To go, take the measure away, go away and think about it and come back again. At the end of the day, the House of Commons is the supreme chamber and the House of Lords comes second. Now just think, the big, big debates of the last two or three decades have been, should we be elected as well? Now, if we were elected, we would then challenge the House of Commons in a big way. It would be massive clashes. We would say, because we're elected, we're as superior and, and as dominating as the Commons can be. Uh, but because we are not elected and appointed, and we've got the purpose of revising and the role of saying, think again, we have a completely contrasting job to do. And uh, I think that masses of scope for improvement, how people are appointed, how many of us, there are far too many, there are just under 800. I've reduced it by one this week. Uh, and uh, the numbers need to be done at least to 600 in the near future. But having said that needs improvement, it's important to understand what the overall role of the Lords is. And I think probably that's as far as I'll go in case there are any questions. 
I'm sure there will be questions. Thank you very much indeed, Richard. Um, I think we should mark the fact that uh, formally you retired from the House of Lords on Monday, which means that you will have continued access, as I understand it, to, to its restaurant and to its club facilities and to its library, but not to speak in debates. And uh, that's right, isn't it? That's exactly right, yeah. Yes. Um, so uh, your title, of course, will continue with you as well. But yeah. um, we're very lucky to have caught you just in the week of your exit. Uh, in a sense, this is your swan song as a member of the House of Lords. And um, we're very, very lucky to have you. And you couldn't have been clearer and more precise in your description. Thank you. Uh, questions. Um, I want to ask um, somebody, no, Elisa and Co from Tanzania, if you would put the question that you didn't have the opportunity to put to Lord Ahmad, because I think Richard Luce might have um, an interesting answer to it. Do you still have the question with you? You need to unmute yourself, perhaps. Hello. Hello. Uh, my name is Inoy Elisa, and I'm from Tanzania. I'm doing my PhD in electronic government uh, from Northumbria University at Newcastle. So my question actually is on the... Uh, economic sanctions, which all sometimes is imposed on some countries due to some issues. So I'm asking if there is any possibility that the UK Parliament could convince the United Nations to find a way of sanctioning only the country leaders rather than the whole country in order to have less effect on the uh, like um, um, uh, people rather than the whole country. I thought it was a very subtle question, which is why I want it put to, to a parliamentarian, which is whether there is some way in which sanctions can not impair a whole country, which it often impacts particularly on poor people, uh, yeah. but leaders who are being held morally accountable by the sanctions. Richard Luce. Yes, it's very interesting, this. Of course, I remember the time, I was Minister for Africa at the time that Rhodesia turned into Zimbabwe, and we had the, uh, under Lord Carrington's leadership, negotiations uh, in Lancaster House, London, uh, about proceeding towards independence for uh, what is now Zimbabwe. And of course, through all the previous years leading up to independence, there had been heavy sanctions imposed uh, by us and by other United Nations countries on the uh, Rhodesia. Uh, which we didn't recognize um, and was led by Ian Smith. And there have been plenty of studies since about the effects and values of uh, sanctions. You can argue that it helps for a time at least to the person you're imposing the sanctions upon uh, to enable them to say, well, up against it, come on, you rally everybody behind you. Uh, that is one problem. Um, but uh, on the other hand, in the long term, uh, it is important to make clear your views. And um, th that uh, is what we did with South Africa, that what we did with Zimbabwe. And in the end, it does have a devastating effect. Now, I think uh, technology has gone slightly wrong here. No, no, we can hear you. That's... You can hear me. Yeah, yeah, no, everything's fine. Yeah, good. If you I've, not given, I've not given him our colleague from Tanzania, which is a wonderful country. I've been to and I remember meeting Julius Nyeri. Okay. I haven't given a good answer, but there are arguments both ways. And they do sometimes add to an advantage to the, the person you're imposing the sanction on, for a time at least. One has to be aware of that. When I say the person, I mean the president or the prime minister and the government of the day. Okay, sure. No, Elisa, do you want quickly to come back on that? I wonder if there's a follow-up you wanted. Okay, uh, the, if, actually, I um, just want to ask if, for instance, the sanction state is a member of the Commonwealth, and then is there any, like, a uh, program for the UK government to support the uh, people of that country during the, that period of sanction? Which I'm way? not absolutely sure whether I, perhaps, uh, Alistair, if you could just in line, I didn't pick I didn't, it up I completely. I didn't catch the very beginning. I think you put your hand over your mouth. So if you okay, just... sorry. Yes, that, I couldn't quite hear what you were saying. No, I couldn't either. 
Okay, I'm asking, uh, is the UK government have any program to support the sanctioned state if it's a member of the Commonwealth? Which country are you talking of? Like, for instance, if the sanction is applied or imposed on, on the Commonwealth member, then is the UK government have any uh, program to support the citizens of that nation during that period? I see. Where if sanctions are imposed on a country, does the British government have a way of supporting that country during? Yeah, the if it's a member of the Commonwealth, yeah. Yes, yeah, so it's related to the other. Yeah, that, that's quite a difficult one. If uh, I would have thought that if that particular country was a full member of the Commonwealth, and therefore accepted all the principles to which the Commonwealth countries are committed, of democracy. Uh, uh, free way of life, the rule of law, all that, then I would have thought uh, Britain uh, and indeed other Commonwealth countries who are in sympathy with that country and in sympathy with the Commonwealth principles uh, would be able to support it. But that's assuming that these are not sanctions imposed by the United Nations uh, and which do contradict, for example, the standards of the Commonwealth. Well. Thank you. Okay. Is there another question from a, a, a scholar to Richard Luce? Uh, I, I haven't caught one on the screen. If not, I've got my own question, which is there is always under discussion in this country the possibility of the House of Lords being reformed quite dramatically. Uh, maybe it, it does become an elected assembly or that the hereditary element, which accounts for, I think, still 90 peers, is discontinued. There are many reforms have been suggested, but none have ever really been pushed through. Do you see that day coming? Well, you know, it's very interesting. This is, this is where the good old British way of dealing with things, which is incremental uh, and pragmatic, is where it works out best, in my view. If you look at the history of the Lords, there were some big reforms in 1911, uh, a long time ago, 110 years ago, which led to uh, taking away some of the powers of the House of Lords, but giving them powers to delay legislation up to up to two years. There have been a number of reforms in the last century, one of which was the appointment of life peers in 1958. And that has been, in my judgment, a great uh, success, because up to then, the House of Lords uh, was uh, really full of hereditary peers, uh, who, many of whom were uh, magnificently independent-minded, which is a good thing. Uh, but is not uh, very representative of the range of expertise available in this country. Uh, and uh, that is a very big and important uh, uh, reform. Then in 1999, uh, the number of hereditary pairs reduced to 92, so that there is now a balance of all the different parties with a few hereditary pairs uh, uh, amounting in all the various parties in the House, including the independent members. So uh, I think it's pragmatic reform, and uh, the present one is on a voluntary basis, which is that we should try to get ourselves down to 600, which is a more sane number of people. And I think at the end of the day, it should be moved even further to about 500, to, in order to enable it to do a good job. Well, it is said that it's the largest assembly of politicians in the world after Absolutely. the uh, People's Assembly in Beijing. So Absolutely. that seems yeah. quite heavy. Yeah. I've made my contribution this week in any event <laughs> by reducing the size a bit. <laughs> yeah. Well, friends, fellow Commonwealth scholars, we've, I think you'll agree this afternoon, been privileged to listen to four outstanding speakers, but um, uh, Lord Luce is the most venerable member of the Houses of Parliament and his contribution to this seminar this afternoon has been so clear so informed and drawing from a lifetime's experience in both houses. Uh, I hope that um, a lot of what he said will have been noted down and you will take it back to your own country so you can reflect on it when you're busily reforming your own parliaments in the future and decide whether you want to follow a model similar to the Westminster one or not. Um, Richard, thank you very, very much. It's always good to have you on occasions like this. Uh, we know that we're going to get a, a very professional job. And although you've withdrawn from the House of Lords formally, you're not withdrawing from the Commonwealth or from uh, 
uh, public affairs totally, I hope. And uh, Not at all, and I'm delighted to be with all the Cornwall scholars today. It's your home territory, so... Absolutely. Once again, as I've done with other speakers, just ask you to raise your hands, because that's the only visual thing we can do, and just say thank you to Lord Luce. Uh, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much, Richard. See you soon. Thank you. Well, friends, we come towards the end of this uh, part of the um, occasion, uh, and it's appropriate that the last contribution should come from the Secretary General of the Association of Commonwealth Universities herself, is Joanna Newman. Um, Joanna has given very distinguished service in many ways to higher education in this country, Vice Principal of King's College, University of London, and so on. Um, uh, she travels relentlessly around the Commonwealth. I'd be interested to check in with her one day as to how many Commonwealth countries she has not yet visited, but it can't be too many. Uh, and she's a force for good in all sorts of ways. So um, I would like, if you uh, um, would bear with it, to have Joanna Newman now, Secretary General, Association of Commonwealth Universities, um, to draw the occasion to a close. I will formally sign off after her, but the last important word is with Joanna. Joanna Newman. Thank you so much, Alistair, and, um, and, and thank you for that very nice introduction. And my job is really to thank everybody before you go off on your virtual tour of Parliament. But I do want to say that the interesting thing about travel these days is that I have far more likelihood of visiting all 54 Commonwealth countries virtually than I would ever have had in a pre-COVID world. And actually, one of the wonderful things that has emerged from this pandemic and from this awful situation that we find ourselves in is that actually technology is such a force for good and I think this event has proved it really in the way that we are all connecting to each other and being able to speak because of course we would have preferred you to be in Parliament today but I think that we've managed uh, magnificently not least because of these wonderful speakers and I want to thank uh, Richard Middleton, Alistair Niven, Peter Williams uh, who's actually not spoken but is, is part of this, uh, Lord Ahmed of Wimbledon, uh, Stephen, uh, Stephen Twig, Harriet Baldwin and Lord Luce for your really um, inspirational uh, talks and also for taking questions from our scholars um, and I think what united all of the, the the talks this afternoon is the belief in the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission and the belief in what you are going to be doing um, in your careers in your studies now and in your careers um, at, at, over, over the next few years and we know that you will be contributing hugely to development because we know that all 26,000 alumni of Commonwealth schemes have done so and one of the wonderful things about the family that you've joined is that we keep you connected to, uh, to, to former Commonwealth scholars and that we hope that we keep uh, a contact with you as you develop your careers. And just looking at some of the subjects you're doing from advanced chemical engineering to cybersecurity, development economics, education, all of the subjects you're studying in different ways have a direct impact on development. And Stephen was very generous earlier on in mentioning the ACU's commitment to the Sustainable Development Goals, which of course, as Commonwealth Scholars, you're also committed to, and we introduce you to linking your, your work to them right at the beginning when you come to the UK. We don't believe there is a single one of the 17 Sustainable Development Goals that can be achieved without the role of higher educational research contributing in some way whether it is training of primary school teachers or pedagogy or the kind of applied or blue sky research that you'll all be involved in. And so we're absolutely passionate about higher education being part of development. And so we were also very pleased to hear Lord Ahmed confirm that development is going to be firmly within the context of the newly merged uh, Foreign and Commonwealth and DFID offices. So um, I want to thank you as scholars for attending this event. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this afternoon and you'll enjoy the tour even more, I suspect, or as much as. We want to encourage you to get involved in all the virtual events and activities that will be available to you through the Commonwealth Scholarship Commission while you're here and afterwards through our massive alumni network. Um, but keep an eye out for the monthly email newsletter as well, CSC Mail and mailings inviting to activities. And also let us know if you want to start something yourself that we can support and, and support you in reaching out to either former or current um, scholars. 
I just want to say a few words about COVID. On the one hand, I think there's been some very good news because we found that technology has actually, there's an opportunity here, I think, for technology to leapfrog perhaps progress in countries where access to higher education has been uh, really difficult. So you have a huge demand and very little supply. So there is huge potential for good pedagogy, for good blended learning, for, for, for a really excellent way of reaching out to people who really need and can benefit from education. On the other side, um, COVID has exposed a huge divide and huge inequalities in the world, not least in data. That's something that the ACU will be taking up with Commonwealth governments. We've just done a massive survey of our universities to find that many have uh, suffer from a lack of access to, to good data. So it is an unprecedented time and you as young leaders will be the future in this post COVID world and we rely on you to lead us through this and to actually demonstrate to parliamentarians in your countries and in the UK that the work that you're going to be doing and the work you're doing now relates directly to, to keeping the world, to, to putting the world in a safer place post this COVID pandemic because we certainly will, fe uh, will face future uh, uh, future pandemics and future challenges. So um, I just want to again thank you for the work that you've done. You're all incredibly impressive. I was a commissioner once and I remember one of the main pleasures of the commissioner role is to look at all the applications and you all should be congratulated just for being Commonwealth scholars, let alone for what you'll go on to do in your future careers. Um, and just hope that you, you make the very most of the time that you're here and when you go back that you keep in touch. Um, so with that, I just want to thank um, the Commonwealth Scholarship and Fellowship Plan Support Group who are indefatigable and wonderful in supporting um, the work that the Commonwealth does from 1959. The, the scheme that is funded to support you was founded in 1959 and many Commonwealth governments support it. Um, I think Lord Ahmed referred to um, Prince Harry at the Chogham, uh, mentioning the Queen Elizabeth Commonwealth Scholarships, which were launched then, which are two year fully funded masters in low and middle income countries, uh, which again, they're actually online now, their applications are open for that. These are incredibly important schemes that keep um, the interconnectivity of the Commonwealth and the exchange of ideas and the celebration of diversity alive. Um, so we are very, very grateful to the CSFP support group. Um, to the CSC Secretariat, not least Hannah and other colleagues who've made this event so vibrant and so interesting. Thank you all so much for your hard work. Um, and with that, I just want you to go off and enjoy your virtual tour and your networking sessions, which I hope will be formal and fun. Thank you very much. Well, Joanna, thank you very much. You lead a team of um, one of the most energetic and cheerful teams of, uh, of people that I've ever worked with. And they, they have been absolutely magnificent in planning this session. All the credit for, for it working well goes to them, you know, getting it going. I'm really grateful. But you yourself um, show great leadership and you've um, summarised where the ACU stands, I think, very effectively. Can I just underline um, the point, two points you made, one about feedback and suggestions. Um, uh, it's not been possible this afternoon, there were so many people participating in this occasion to take questions from everyone. Uh, uh, those of you who couldn't put their questions, I apologise that we couldn't take them. We will try and create other opportunities of a physical kind when COVID allows for you to do that, as I suggested, for example, to Stephen Twigg. But um, I do think that if you have any comments on today, um, you should let the ACU or, or any of us know. Um, and allied to that is the general point Joanna made about the value of Zoom, which COVID-19 in a strange kind of way has thrown up. You can get more people together uh, in a Zoom conversation than they're likely to meet except for, for the most uh, prestigious of conferences in a meeting room in London. I was uh, involved in a discussion a few days ago where contributions came in from the Ivory Coast and from the Caribbean, uh, from Australia and from America. There's no way that those people in those countries at that moment could have assembled in London. You know, travel restrictions for a start would have prevented them being here. Um, so Zoom has its advantages as well as its downside. Uh, I hope you've enjoyed this afternoon. Very grateful to you to be here. 
uh, I want to underline my opening point is as a former Commonwealth scholar myself, I owe so much to this scheme. It's supposed to identify future leaders. It, not sure it did that with me, but it certainly does identify people who are going to be very committed, I think, to good values throughout their careers. And um, all of you have got wonderful opportunities ahead to make a real mark in your own countries. I hope you will look back on this period in the United Kingdom as helping form the person that you will be in the future, as I do my years in Ghana.